This is John Daly in the new Senate building at Rome. Julius Caesar will attend the last session of the Senate on this 15th day of his fifth consulship. Caesar had planned to attend, you know, but then, for some strange reason, he changed his mind and sent word that he would not be present. Some of the senators then sent Decimus Brutus to urge Caesar to come, and apparently his intimate friend and trusted general was able to prevail upon him. A word has just reached us that the master of Rome is on his way here now, this Ides of March, accompanied by Brutus. And so the Senate attendants are again placing Caesar's chair in a rather curious spot. In front of the statue of Pompey, Caesar's old and dead empire. My fifty, forty-four B.C., ancient Rome, you are there. Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, the great Roman conqueror on his way to the Senate. CBS takes you back almost 2,000 years to the day that shook the Roman Empire and changed the course of history. All things are as they were then. Except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact in quotations. And now, the Senate of Ancient Rome and John Daly. That important set of the year. Perhaps Caesar's hesitancy about attending this final session of the Senate is due to the many rumors which are flying thick and fast around Rome. Rumors to the effect that Caesar's enemies, and he has a great many hidden ones amongst the patrician upper classes, are plotting something to block this new era of popular reform ushered in by Caesar since his return from the wars. Just what they can do to stem this tide of social progress, which Caesar has set in motion, is difficult to imagine. But here is one imaginative fellow who seems to see things that ordinary people like you and me miss. He is Artemidorus, a soothsayer, who also makes a living on the side by teaching logic to some of the wealthier citizens of Rome. Artemidorus, how do you reconcile teaching logic with soothsaying? With those who prefer prophecy, I prophesy. With those who prefer logic, I reason. I have found this the most logical way for me to make a living. Sounds logical, but uh, what does your soothsaying say about the rumors that are going around Rome to the effect that Caesar's enemies are plotting against him? Well, uh... I would say that the Ides of March may be a, well, shall we say, a fateful day for Rome. What do you mean by fateful? Oh, nothing for certain. Just that there are certain indications. What indications? Well, uh, indications that this will be a very fateful day. But are you trying to say that Caesar is in danger? Oh, no, no. Not at all, not at all. You see, it is just that... Well, it is just that it is written in the sands and in the stars that, well, that even the mightiest among us may suddenly take leave and dwell with God. All right, then, uh, in your soothsaying mind, exactly what name comes to the surface as plotting Caesar Harm? I see a cloud of names. What are they? The cloud is clearing. I see certain letters. A number of seas. Uh, Yes, go on. The clouds have returned. I cannot see anything anymore. The peace be unto you. Farewell. Our Tenedorus has just hurried away. I think he saw someone, although I'm looking in the direction he looked. And I can see only distinguished senators and several close friends of Caesar's. There's Ligarius and Tilius Simba, Trebonius and Cassius. Uh, Cassius is walking over here. He was recently appointed Peter by Caesar. Uh, good day, Cassius. Good day. Was that Artemidorus the say? Why, yes, Cassius. Do you know him? I have studied some logic with him, but I found the fellow more given to imagination than reason. And what did he say? Well, uh, he thinks Caesar has a lot of enemies. One needn't be a soothsayer to divine that. Every ruler has an opposition. You're speaking of the optimates, I presume, the patrician ruling class. Not only the optimates. Many good and loyal citizens of ordinary rank take exception to some of the things that Caesar has done. Oh, I was under the impression that most of the common people of Rome were ardently for Caesar and his policy of reform. I wish they were. But you know, unfortunately, I have heard talk that many Romans are afraid that Caesar might become king. But how could that be? We all know that Caesar has refused a crown several times. Who can say what a ruler with all of Caesar's power will do next? 
We must always hope for the good of Rome that men with so much power will not abuse it for their own gain. Thank you, Cassius. Caesar has not arrived yet. Uh, oh, but here comes Mark Antony. Perhaps I can get him to say a few words. The proconsul who shares the administration of Rome with Caesar seems to be in fine spirit today. And when Caesar leaves tomorrow to subdue Parthia, Mark Antony will be temporary ruler of Rome, you know, in Caesar's absence. Oh, Mark Antony! Mark Antony, yes. I've been trying to track down a story that there's a plot against Caesar. Oh, that's an old story. People have been plotting against Caesar ever since he was born. He was kidnapped, you know, when he was a boy. <laughs> Plotters. <laughs> Do you remember Labianus? Do you remember Pompey? They all plotted against Caesar. But they're all dead now. But then you do think, Mark Antony, that there may be some substance to this rumor. Oh, no doubt about it. But whoever these plotters may be, let them beware. For all those who plot against my friend Caesar will sooner or later feel the edge of the hungry, naked sword, Mark Antony. Caesar just walked in. He's accompanied by Decimus Brutus and the senators have risen and are greeting him. Caesar carries his tall, slim figure erectly, as usual in military fashion. His gray eyes are sweeping the Senate as he walks. He bows politely to the senators and other high dignitaries. And though his face is kindly as usual, Caesar is not smiling today. He doesn't appear to be too well. He's uh, reached his chair now, is sitting down, carefully arranging the folds of his brilliant white purple bordered toga. Many senators and officials are gathered around him. It's Caesar's custom before the session begins, you know, to hear private petitions. Tilius Simba has approached Caesar and is standing directly in front of Caesar now, oh, holding a petition. Simba is speaking. Let's listen. Great Caesar, liberator father of the fatherland. If you have a petition, Tilia Simba, I will listen to it with a better mind if you do not employ all those flattering and unnecessary adjectives before my name. What is it you wish? Oh, Caesar, you will always be remembered for your clemency and your forgiveness. You pardoned most of your enemies. Please, oh, Caesar, consider my brother, now banished from Rome and living in miserable exile in a barbaric land. I have told you before, Tilius Simba, that I will never pardon your brother. He has not only committed crimes against the state, but also savage crimes against humanity. I do not know how to forgive such evil. Do not beg too hard in his behalf. In fact, that you think him guiltless. And so cover yourself with some of his guilt. But, great Caesar, you have always been kind... I will hear no more of your brother. I beg you, please reconsider the case. I have all the facts here in this petition. Will you think I have... Go ahead, go ahead, What does this mean? That is just a strike... He's fallen, is lying in a pool of blood. Brutus and Cassius stand over his body, clasping hands, congratulating each other. And now Brutus is shouting to Cicero, the venerable leader of the Senate. Cicero! See how the tyrant lies dead at Pompey's feet. Rome is free. Liberty is restored. The Constitution is saved. The senators are running out of the Senate. The men who murdered Caesar are waving their daggers, shouting, Rome is free, the tyrant is dead, liberty is saved. The Senate is emptying rapidly. Julius Caesar is dead. This Ides of March, it means Rome will be in a turmoil. I return you to our CBS This is Ned Chalmer. The men who killed Caesar call themselves the Tyrannicides. Right now, they're staging a torchlight procession along the Via Flaminia. Don Hollenbeck is there in a CBS mobile unit. So over to Don Hollenbeck. The torchlight procession is passing by us now. Many of these paraders are drunk, some with wine, some with the event, and some with coke. The parade is a strange mixture of venerable senators, young perfume dandies, the younger members of the patrician class. But the 
strangest thing about this parade is that there are no people on the street to watch us. Not a soul present to cheer or throw flowers or wave a hat. Uh, one of the leaders of this parade is Tilius Simber, the senator who gave the signal for the attack on Caesar. He's right here beside me. Tilius Simber. Everything is going to be all right. Rome is free. Everybody is free. There's nothing to fear. Nothing. Perhaps the people of Rome aren't sure what will happen, Tilius Simber. Perhaps that's why they're hiding. There is nothing to fear. The people will still get their free food and their free circuses. Bread and circuses. What else the common people need? Perhaps they want liberty and dignity. Liberty Perhaps... and dignity. That's why we dispose of Caesar. The parade is liberty. passing on down the Via Flaminia now. Tilius Simber lurching after it, waving his dagger, oh. shouting to a deserted oh. street. This is Don Holland. I return you to our CBS oh. studio. This is Ned Chalmer again. Cassius, Brutus, and the other leaders of the Tirana sides are now meeting with Mark Antony. Cicero is acting as the mediator. This uh, surprising development would seem to indicate that Mark Antony may make peace with the men who killed his chief. There are even rumors that he'll accept a major post in the, in the new government. The, the body of Caesar has been removed from the Senate and taken to his home by his servants. And, and now here is Quincy Howe to analyze all these fast-moving events. Uh, well, this much seems clear. Mark Antony hopes to avoid another civil war, even if he has to forget his loyalty to Caesar and make a deal with the murderers who, by the way, must now decide and decide fast what to do with Caesar's body. That's because it's always been a custom to throw the dead bodies of murdered tyrants into the river Tiber, an honor, disgrace. But if Caesar's body were thrown into the Tiber, all his laws and appointments would become null and void. And all the men, all the men now meeting with Mark Antony, except Cicero, all these fellows received their appointments to top government jobs from Caesar himself. Thus, if Caesar's body should be thrown into the Tiber, they'd automatically put themselves out of office. Uh, the big question really is no longer Mark Antony, but the people. What will the people do? They can't stay behind locked doors much longer. Here's Ned Calvin. A statement has just been released by the men at Mark Antony's house. It says, it says they've decided to give Julius Caesar a public funeral and that Mark Antony himself will deliver the funeral oration. Ken Roberts and Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, are at Caesar's palace on the Tiber now, waiting to talk to us. So over to Ken Roberts. I am speaking to you from the atrium of Caesar's home. Calpurnia, Caesar's wife, has just learned that the tyrannicides will allow a public funeral for her husband. And she has given orders that the body of Caesar be taken now to the forum. Calpurnia, would you care to comment on the decision of the tyrannicides to allow a public funeral for your husband? Yes. It is an old Roman custom to invite intimate friends to private funerals. A public funeral does not alter this in any way at all. I know Caesar would want all his friends to be present. Uh, Calpurnia, what made Caesar change his mind and attend the Senate? His very close friend, Decimus Brutus, came and persuaded him because there were urgent and pressing matters in the Senate requiring his personal attention. This was the same Decimus Brutus, whom Caesar loved and trusted, whom he raised from perfumed obscurity to wealth, honor, and high position. And all the time he pleaded with Caesar to come, a dagger lay hidden in his toga. And when Caesar came, of all that august and honorable body of senators, not one raised a hand to help. Hirelings, betrayers, puppets for the idle degenerate patricians, they were all conspirators. It was not Caesar who threatened Rome. It is the 500 families that rule our city. They killed my husband because he sided with the people. Caesar never wanted to be king. And every one of those murderers knew it. Thank you, Calpurnia. This is Ken Roberts. I'll return you to CBS. Quincy Howe again. Claudius Cicero has just announced that he will be unable to attend Caesar's funeral. Uh, the leader of the Senate said, and I, I'm quoting... The death of Caesar has so affected me that my physician has advised against my attendance. End quote. Uh, just a few words of comment on this statement of Cicero's. Cicero argued for all he was worth against the public funeral. He said it was playing with fire, especially since Caesar's last will and testament will be read in the forum where the ceremony is about to take place. Uh, now, no one knows what Caesar's will contains, but since Caesar was always generous to the plebeians, there's good reason to believe that his will may contain some surprises which might prove, uh, uh, well, uh, a bit uh, unsettling uh, to the public uh, peace, if you get my drift. 
This is Quincy Howe. I switch you now to John Daly in the farm. Never was our country in greater danger. The speaker you hear addressing the crowd here in the forum is Caius Cassius, one of the leaders of the conspiracy against Caesar. He and other gifted public speakers among the Tyrannicides have been haranguing this crowd of more than 50,000 people, trying to make them see the wisdom and necessity of disposing of Caesar, but the crowd listens quietly, very quietly. The big question is still what's going on in the minds of these 50,000 silent Romans. Cassius has finished speaking, and now uh, Decimus Brutus, the most gifted speaker of all the Tyrannicides, has stepped up to the rostrum. He's greeted with... uh, respectful silence. This should be interesting, so let's listen. Of Rome, I, Decimus Brutus, was Caesar's closest friend, yet I killed him. I, Decimus Brutus, was his trusted general and confidant, yet I betrayed him. Why then did I take his life? Was it to enrich myself? The death of Caesar will not make any of us richer. Was it because I bore him a grudge? No one had more cause to love and honor him than I. Why then did I kill and betray my friend? The answer is, citizens of Rome, that Caesar was a grave danger to Rome. For Caesar would be king. You cannot have both a king and a republic. Our great nation is a democracy, a magnificent civilization which cannot abide kings or emperors. For then we would be like the barbarians who have not learned how precious and sweet is liberty. Oh, Romans, here in my hand is the dagger with which I slew my dear friend. It is still sharp and keen. If I have wronged you, citizens of this free land, if I have wronged you by killing Caesar, then shall I plunge this dagger gladly into my breast. Speak, citizens of Rome! No! Most of the big crowd is unmoved and silent. Their attention has turned away from the rostrum to the approach of Caesar's funeral procession. Decimus Brutus is speaking again. You have given me your answer. I sheath my dagger. Caesar's funeral procession approaches. By my permission, Mark Antony will deliver the funeral oration. Stay and listen to him. For you all know that in some respects, Caesar did serve his country well. It is fitting that you pay him your last respects. And so, farewell, good citizens. We shall meet again on some happier occasion. Brutus has left the rostrum. The funeral procession is inside the forum now, coming to a halt in front of the rostrum itself. Elpernia, wearing a shabby toga, as is the custom, and Mark Antony seem to be the principal mourners. The body of Caesar is being carried on a couch and placed in front of the rostra. Six citizens are carrying it. The couch is draped with a white cloth trimmed with purple, and now the music has stopped, and the herald steps forward. This citizen, Caius Julius Caesar has surrendered to death. Mark Antony will now deliver the funeral oration. My fellow Romans, my countrymen, I need not tell you of Caesar's great and good deeds, as is the manner at funerals. You know them well enough. You remember who forced the optimates, the nobles, to give the people a share of the public lands. It was not Cassius. No, not Cassius. It was Caesar. 
now dead by Cassius' hand. Do you remember, citizens of Rome, who passed a law that allowed liberated slaves to become citizens? It was not similar. No, not similar. But Caesar, the man seized Simber so cruelly stabbed. Do you recall, good citizens, who it was the Senate declared to be, godlike in his clemency to his enemies? It was not sinner. No, not sinner. But the man sinner cut down with a hideous dagger. Can you bring to mind my fellow countrymen who three times refused the offer of a crown? It was not Decimus Brutus. No, not Brutus. But the man Brutus so monstrously betrayed. Yet all these conspirators have nothing to say about Caesar but that he was ambitious, that he desired to be a king. Although they, they knew, they knew it well that Caesar, now lying fiercely dead before us, never wished to be a king. Citizens, I will tell you why they killed him. They killed him because he stood in the way of those corrupt aristocrats upon whom Caesar weighs unremitting war all his life. Mark Antony is not in league with the conspirators, has dropped the mask of collaboration. He's attacking the tyrannicides with power and passion, and the crowd has suddenly come alive. This is what they've been waiting for. Enough enough of enough of we have a matter of a last will to be read. Caesar's will. And you shall hear it now. I bid you, Herald, step forward and read Caesar's last will and testament. Step forward. The Herald steps forward, unrolls the parchment. The crowd is hushed, straining. I, Caius Julius Caesar, do declare this to be my will. This will to be executed immediately upon my death. To each citizen of Rome, I hereby allot 75 drachmas. My gardens along the Tiber River, so long coveted by many envious aristocrats, I bequeath to the people of Rome as a public park. What remains of my property, I bequeath to Octavius Caesar, my nephew, should Octavius fail, then I name as my second heir, Decimus Brutus. Stepping back, the herald rolls up the parchment, and the crowd is now denouncing Decimus Brutus, all the conspirators, is calling for vengeance. Mark Antony has stepped up to the body of Caesar. He puts the covering off the body, and the mutilated body of Caesar now lies exposed. The crowd is in a frenzy. Pitchy Zane! Pitchy Zane! Here lies the father of your country. Here lies the hero of Rome. Here lies our beloved comrade and friend. Here he is, lifeless, although the Senate had sworn to protect him with their lives. Here he lies dead, dead not by disease or age or war, but killed by his own countrymen. Oh, Caesar, those whom you spared and showed mercy and kindness, they have spilt your life away. Where, where, Caesar, is your love for mankind? Where, where now are those great and noble laws you, you'd pass for the common people? Caesar, stand 
stand up. Stand up and let the public see you. You cannot, for you are murdered. Murdered by the very same people you saved. Oh, Rome. Oh, citizens of Rome. Our father, our comrade, by his quiet and still and forever dead. Roman, let us not proceed to the campus marshals for the funeral fire. Let us have the funeral fire here and now in the forum. No greater defiance can we give to the conspirators. Caesar's fire and hunt down and burn and kill the conspirators. The crowd rose in silence, approval, and the funeral music has started again. The tyrannicide has failed. Their bid for power is over. Even in death, Caesar has halted and execution or exile awaits the conspirators. Flaming torches are being. The eyes of heart for the poor do not see. Julius Caesar is assassinated and the course of history is changed. You have been listening to The Assassination of Julius Caesar, another broadcast in the series You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The Assassination of Julius Caesar was written by Sigmund Miller. Mark Antony was played by Torin Thatcher. And the cast included Thomas Chalmers, Raymond Edward Johnson, Wesley Addy, David Oreck, Richard Waring, Ann Seymour, Guy Sorrell, Bert Cowlin, and others. Next week... June 30th, 1520, Mexico City. The death of Montezuma. You are there. Broadway is my beat, says Detective Danny Clover. And today, Danny's going to explore the strange actions of an out-of-work Broadway actor engaged to an heiress who is a friend of Danny's. Broadway is my beat. We'll come to you later this afternoon on most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>